It's almost 4 p.m., a bit after. You had like five or six lectures already, and a big tasty lunch. How many of you would like to have a refreshing cup of coffee right now? Raise your hands. <laughs> Woo! Okay, so let's imagine we have our very own coffee machine right here in the room. Even better, a barista. And you walk up to the barista, and you can order whatever coffee you like. You will probably choose something famous like a cappuccino. The barista will say, okay, no problem. It goes out the back, prepares one, bring it back to you, you walk away, and you walk away happy. You didn't have to specify to the barista, I would like to have a cup of water with two sugars and some milk. He immediately knew what your intention were, a cappuccino. This was easy because you and the barista had a common vocabulary. You spoke the same language. I'm here to tell you that we as developers can have the same process in our work. We can have the same flow with our users and our product requirements. Even better, once we have the building blocks and the common vocabulary, we can turn this into this. So now that we are all refreshed from our imaginary cup of coffee. Let me properly introduce myself. My name is Alon. I'm working for Wix for two and a half years now almost, and I'm developing Wix stores, the e-commerce platform for Wix. And today I'm going to talk to, you, talk to you about DSLs. I'm going to show you that DSLs are not that scary. Even so, they are quite easy. And, they, and by the end of the lecture, you will have the tools and you will know why DSLs are good for and why Scala is a good language to implement them. So, let's get started. What's the official definition of a DSL? Well, according to Wikipedia, it's a programming language specialized to a particular application domain. Well, you might ask yourself, how is it different from any other programming languages? Well, there's two points. The first one is DSL is targeted to solve only a specific problem. The second one, DSL offers you a higher abstraction of the problem. What does it actually mean? Well, when you implement a DSL, you don't really care about the underlying implementation. You just want to tell what you want and get it. You don't care about data structures, memory, cloud engines. Basically, these cells are made to feed their purpose only. Sorry. So let's see a few examples of this cell we might all know. The first one I, I want, would like to show you is basically a coffee cell, the one from before. I claim that a coffee is a this cell because we have a vocabulary for it. We have our building blocks. I can describe using these words on the screen, like milk, sugar, the ingredients. I can describe the units, one cup, one teaspoon, all of it combines is, offer me, is off offers me a language to build another building blocks like other drinks of coffee. And it solves a particular problem in the, in the area of coffee. Another well-known DSL is MySQL. MySQL is a data query and analyzing or manipulation tool. We all use it when we need to solve area issues in the problem in the area of data. Another one is CSS. CSS is a DSL as well because it offers you the ability to decide how web components look and behave. So if we take a step, a step backwards and we try to understand what actually a DSL is or what was the process we did with the barista, it's pretty much the same as we do as developers. We have the problem domain and we need some way to get to the solution implementation. Well, the question is why is that road from A to B sometimes that hard? Well, the issue is complexity. Every time we implement a solution to our code, we deal with complexity. We have two kinds of complexity, an essential one and an accidental one. The essential complexity is basically the heart of the problem we're trying to solve. This is the main issue. This is like sending a rocket into space. Whatever you do, it is still a hard problem. You cannot avoid it. On the other hand, essential complexity, well, it's up to us. It's up to us because we decide how we choose to implement the solution. We can control it. Here we see some other examples of accidental, accidental and essential complexities. Well, 
I claim that these cells can help us reduce the accidental complexity of our code because we control it. For example, here we see some tests using JUnit framework. I don't want you even to go into details. Just take a higher look at this test. It has some assert, it has some structure, but it's not very clear what it does. On the other end, if we look at the Specs 2 test, you can almost immediately see the flow of the test. It looks like English. You can understand the intent of the author of this test. So now that we know what these cells basically are, and we saw a few examples of them, um, we would like a language to implement them on. Well, we own Scalapino, so basically, it obviously, it would be Scala. Scala offers us a lot of good features that reduce the amount of code that we write and allow us to mm, pass our intention into the code in a very clear way. Let's see what features Scala offers us to build good DSLs on. So the first one is flexible syntax. We're going to see some examples, and I'm going, going to go over them quick, uh, quickly. The first one is optional dots. We don't have to write any dots when we invoke method. Semicolon inferences. Optional parentheses. And type inference. You don't have to mention the type of a value object when you initiate a new one. All of these together help us write less code. The less code we, we write, the less code we see in our eyes, it, it's easier to understand the code. Another feature Scala has is consigns lambda ex expressions. We can, using lambda expressions, we can pass on expressive functions using minimal syntax. For example, I can, in one line, go over an entire array and increase each, each, each member of the array by one. Or I can sort an array using a, a comparable function, and so on. Another feature Scala has is case classes. Case classes is a perfect way to design abstractions of something, of objects. Why are they a perfect way? Because A, they have default parameters, default values. I can pass on the default values I want. B, they have named arguments. So I can basically initiate a new class called name, give it first equals high, last equals there. It's really clear th what the, what's this case class, what its context is. Another great thing Scala offers us is implicit. Well, you probably heard the word implicit like 10 times already today, but bear with me one more time. Scala implicits are basically methods and functions that are um, implicitly wired by the Scala compiler do, uh, by searching the matching signature in our current scope. So they provide us an implicit conversion from type to type. They are statically typed, and they allow us to create lexically scope open class. That actually means that we can extend the syntax of existing class that we can do not have in our code. For example, I can later on extend Scala sec or Scala int. I'm going to see some examples. The first one is implicit parameters, which basically is a, seri is a very simple example. We have a function, say hello, that takes two parameters. One of them is explicit, is implicit, sorry. Later on, we initiate a new implicit value, and when you call say hello with only one parameter, the output will be, hi, George. Scala implicit conversion allows us to convert from type A to type B. So if we have a function that all accepts only ints, but we're trying to pass on a double, we will get a compilation error. If we add an implicit function to it, we can easily solve this issue because the compiler will, will search in its current scope for a matching signature and will convert the type from into a double. Sorry. Okay, Scala open classes. A um, how many of you use this right error when you use code? How many of you know how it works? Okay, so <laughs> basically this is an ability of Scala where Scala has a class, an implicit class called, called errorsec, and the errorsec defines for any object this new method, right error. We have both, the, both versions, one of them I think is the pretty one, and the one is the ugly one. So uh, basically using this implicit function, we can take an input self A and return a tuple of A and B. So. Up until now, we saw what DSLs are. We saw what tools Scala gives us to build good DSLs. 
Let's get dirty and actually build a DSL. We're going to go over step-by-step -step example where I'm going to explain each conversion from sentence to sentence. So what are we actually building? Well, as I said before, I'm developing Wix stores, the e-commerce platform, and I've been doing so for about two years now. Uh, when we first started the development of the project, we needed to implement the logic of calculating shopping carts values. For example, the discount, the tax, the shipping costs, and the, the shipping costs and all of this all together. And we did so. We implemented the solution, and it works great, and it's scalable, and I have all these classes and traits, and it's good. But every now and then, when I need to go back into the code and like take a higher look and understand all the small details, it's pretty much hard for me because I, I always need to dig in. So I thought it, I thought it would be cool to implement a, a new version of it using these cells with you. So let's say our imaginary product or company head comes to us and listens and says, hi, in English, I would like a, a, to have a system that supports the four, the five following rules. The first one, for Canada, the tax rule is 50% of cow total. The second one, for UK, is 12% of cow total, but I would like to ignore the shipping cost when I calculate tax. The third one is for the USA, well, it's 7%, and when you calculate the tax, you should ignore both discount and shipping. The first one is, well, Finland, it's a good country, it's only 5% tax, and we would like to, when we calculate the tax, we would like to ignore the shipping cost, sorry, we, we would like to ignore the discount only if the shipping cost is larger than 4 euros. And the last one is, this is Israel, we would like to have a special tourist custom tax just for fun. So, let's dig in. When I heard this theoretical requirements, I immediately, as a good engineer, tried to transform it into an actual concrete requirements, which are the tax for a shopping cart is calculated by, by the shipping country. Tax is different for each country, and tax calculation is dependent on other factors like shipping and discount. The process that I need to do right now is to define a common vocabulary between me and the product guy. And if I do so, I will get a few benefits. First of all, I will have clear communication between myself, the product guy, and the QA, and whatever, and, and the, even the UX. Whoever involves, is involved in the same project will have the same language. We can speak to each other fluently without having to translate technical issues into product issues. The second benefit I will get is I will be, I will be able to show a non-technical personnel the test that I write, and he, and he could, in theory, understand the logic that I'm, that I'm trying to test and even correct me if I'm wrong. So let's take the uh, English requirements that we got and try, and, and try to extract our common vocabulary from it. The first thing that we look, that, that we see, is that we have a list of countries. We have also, we have a few, a few fields that are related to the shopping cart. We have the total, the discount, and the shipping. We have our verbs. We can either ignore or add a value to the text calculation. And we even have a predicate, if and larger. And we also have the actual text around themselves. So let's understand the relationship between each other. We know a tax is calculated on a cart. Cart is shipped to a specific country, and cart might or might not have a discount. Well, let's dig into the code. And the first thing we're going to look is our domain abstractions. We're going to try to, using the, the tools Scala gives us, to model our domain into code. So we have a case class which represents the cart. It has total shipping, discount, and country. Notice that cart does not have any tax on it. Tax is a product of cart calculation. We also have a companion object for cart, shipping and discount. Shipping and discount are simple functions that, get, that gets a cart and extract a certain field out of it. We have the countries list. The system supports several countries. Here they are before you. Israel, USA, Finland, UK, and Canada. And another, thing that, another important thing that we have is a few types. 
The types represent the relationship between the object, be between the abstractions we saw before. We have count predicate, which takes account and returns a Boolean. We have a text calculator, which, take, which takes account and returns the big decimal, which actually represents the text. And we have a country to text calculation. Basically, you get a, a tuple with a country and the text calculator for that country. So, what else? Let's try and implement the first requirement. For Canada, the tax is 15%. So every DSL needs an entry point, something to begin the process of speaking the same language. I chose to use a function called for. Uh, why capital for, anyone? Yeah, the small for was already, unfortunately, used by Scala, so I have to compromise and use the capital for. And the capital for is, the for function is really simple. All it does, it takes a country and returns a country container. A country container is another simple case class which has a take function. The take function represents one of the verbs we saw before. And all it does, it, return, it, it returns a country to text calculation. So this is the English sentence. This is our code for Canada, parentheses, dot, take, parentheses, 15, which is nice, but if we actually remove all the crappy stuff that we can reduce, we are left for Canada, take 15. So, okay, one out of five, nice. Let's see what's going on under the hood. The for function invokes, takes as a parameter of the Canada, the country. It returns a country container, which then invokes the take function, which takes another parameter, the actual text amount, and returns a country to text calculation. So, the second requirement. For UK, the tax is 12%. Ignore the shipping cost. The first part is already supported. Can we extend our solution to support the second part as well? Well, unfortunately, no. Because by the time we try to get and evaluate the second part of the sentence, ignore the shipping costs, we are already left with a decimal, the text amount itself. So we need to take a step back and actually add an intermediate step. This is the old country container, and this is the new country container. The new country container changed a bit. All it does that all it does now is instead of returning the actual country to text calculation, it will return a text and country. What's a text and country, you say? Well, it's another case class that has a new verb, the ignore. The ignore function actually takes a function count field, which takes a count and returns a certain field of that count. And what it does when it gets all the details that, that it needs, it returns a tuple from country to count to the text calculation for that count. So using these two, these two new features, let's see what we can do. For UK, the tax is 12%, ignore the shipping cost. And once again, without all the crappy stuff, we are left with this. So far, so good. Again, under the hood, now we have the take function. It will return a text and country container, which will then invoke the ignore function, which, which, which will take the shipping parameter and return us the country to text calculation. So, but what happens to the first sentence we supported before? Since we use the text in the country container now, if you, if, you, if, you, if you remember, we are left with a text in country container, but we need a country to text calculation. So how can we solve that issue? Well, we need to fix it, and we're going to fix it using Scala implicits, because the first calculation, the first sentence that we support is already done. All we, need is, all we need is to convert it from the country and text to the calculation itself. So gonna, we are going to add an implicit function, text and country to text calculation, that all it does is implicitly transforms from type, from type A to type B. So let's see how, uh, how it looks now. We have the implicit conversion going on, and we get the country to text calculation. So let's take a, a few short break and review the process we've done so far. We got the English requirements. We understood the relationship. We created our domain abstractions. We implemented some logic. We broke some other logic. We stack a step back and fixed it. So, number three. Well, now we need to ignore both the shipping cost and the discount. 
So can we improve the ignore function to take multiple parameters? Well, this is the old version, and with a very simple trick Scala gives us called var args, we can just in change this, the function in a really minimal way and now support a few count fields that we can ignore. Uh, since count fields is now uh, basically is a sequence from 0 to n of fields, we need to treat it as a sequence. So we're going to use the fold left combinator to accumulate all the fields we would like to ignore. So now we can support this function. But, sorry, I need the punchline. We can do even better. So how can we do even better? I don't like the comma over there. So let's see how can we take it to the next level. This is the, our familiar nice old count, uh, count companion object, currently shipping a discount on still simple functions. Well, I would like to introduce a new player to the game, the count combinator. The count combinator will allow us to again extend our syntax and our vocabulary. The count combinator is a simple class as well. All it does, it takes a count field, the same known function from count to a certain field, and it adds a new verb. Sorry, it, add, it, it adds a new word, end. And takes another count combinator and returns us a new one that combines both of their logic. So, okay. Now we need to look at the ignore function. The ignore function also changed because it used to work with the old version of the before the count combinators. But it changed not that much. All I did is, again, I added in the count combinators with var args, and I added some helper methods called, cal called calculate text and combine all rules, which pretty much does the same logic. It takes a sequence of count combinators, combines them into one, and returns a country to text calculation. So now we can do this. Instead of the comma that we used before, now we have end. We can ignore discount and shipping. Well, what happens if we try to remove the parentheses around discount and shipping? The compiler will complain, listen, I don't understand what end is. So um, how can we overcome this issue as well? Well, we're going to add something new. We're going to add the ampersand operator. And all it does is basically overloading an existing operator of Scala. Behind the scene, it will call the same known end function. And now we can do this, which looks much, much, much cooler. The question is, why, this the first when, when, why did when we removed the first parentheses from the first sentence didn't work? Well, the, the answer is operator prescendence of Scala. When we use the, um, the end operator, it actually evaluates before anything else. Here we have all the Scala operators by order. So if you look behind the scenes what's going on, we actually see that, that up until now, text and country container is the same invocation we know we known until far. But now, what's evaluate, what Scala compiler evaluates next is and shipping, which will return us a new count combinator. Altogether, we get a country to text calculation. Sorry. OK, so. Uh, this is what we support so far. This is, what needs to, what, this is what we need to support next. For Finland, the tax is 5%. When calculating the tax, ignore discount if shipping cost is larger than, than 4. The last part is again unsupported. We now need to add a predicate. So we're going to go back to our old friend, the count combinator, and we're going to add two, field, two methods to it. The first one is if. If is basically, again, with capital I, because if is a reserved word, again, basically is a function, certain condition. And if the certain condition applies and is true to the count, it will add the, it will ignore a count field. Otherwise, it will return zero, meaning ignore nothing. And we're going to add the greater than. The greater than is just another syntax expansion, that which, has, which will allow us to define certain 
conditions using the cloud predicate. OK, so this is the cloud combinator altogether now. And you can see how, uh, how our syntax expanded over the iterations. We have the end, we have the operator end, we have the if, and we have the greater than. So let's see what we get now. For Finland, take 0 0.5, ignore discount if shipping cost is larger than, than 4. Let's remove all this unnecessary stuff, and we are left with this. So what's going on under the hood? The first part is the same as usual. The second one is we first evaluate the predicate. If the condition is true or not, and we will turn a cloud combinator anyway. The cloud combinator will represent the evaluation of the parentheses, of the condition. We then invoke the ignore function, and in the end, we get a country to text calculation. So we are down to our final requirements for Israel, where we need to support custom text and custom fields. We're going to extend our vocabulary once again. And we're going to do so by adding two new functions. The first one is a private function called addCustomValue, which basically will take a function from count to any count field. This is f. And it will add it to the text calculation. The second one is add to price, because we, we would like the, to have the ability to add several, to extend our vocabulary each time with a different verb. We don't like to, it won't be expressive to just, to, to just use the add custom value. So we're going to add the add tourist price. And in it, called, it calls the add custom value function. So let's see what we got now. Now we can pass on a lambda expression into the DSL, where we're going to take 20% of the count total and add it as a tourist price when we calculated the tax for Israel. This is again the behind the scenes, and as we see, we get the country to text calculation. So we've, we've gone through a long way. We actually build our five requirements. You, you can see them in the screen. Now it's time to use them. So before we do, let's see where we started and where we are now. On the left side, we have the English version. On the right side, we have the DSL. I'm just going to leave it for the screen for a minute so we can appreciate the beauty and simplicity of it all. Just endure it. <laughs> OK, so we can see that it's really, really almost similar. You can show the right side to anyone, I guess, outside the room, and it will understand the logic and the calculation and the rules. Well, this, is, this is was our goal. This, is, this is was our aim. It's not perfect, and I'm going to speak about why it's not that perfect. But first, let's see how we actually use it. So you can see we're just importing a text.dsl object, where I put all the DSL, you, that all the functions that, that, that you saw before, a simple Scala object, nothing more. And then I would like to calculate a theoretical value of a shopping cart. So let's say a text rules are the same text rules you saw before with all the, with all the DSL support. A cart is a theoretical tar is a theoretical cart that is shipped to the USA with some value for shipping and discount. And I would like to calc I would like to find a text rule for that cart. Well, if you remember, if you look uh, closely, you will see that a text rule it just is just a regular Scala sec. While I would like to operate the find rule operator on it, the find rule method. Well, to do so, we're going to have to enrich an existing Scala class. Well, Scala implicit to the rescue once again. And all we have to do right now is just add an implicit uh, class called text rule seek or text rule sequence, whatever you would like, which will every time we, that you try to invoke the find rule for on a Scala sequence, if you are in the scope where this implicit conversion is imported, you will just be able to call this method. So. Another point I would like to speak about is arrows. Up until now, we thought of a common vocabulary by understanding the requirements of the user. We build our language. But we have to remember that arrows 
and exceptions are part of the DSL as well. And they are part of the DSL as well because of two things. The first one is a really cool one. If you model your domain correctly using Scala abstractions and using types and classes, a lot of the logic of the domain is already enforced for you by the compiler. If you try to mm, somehow bypass the rules, the compiler will just say it won't compile. The second one that we need to remember is that this is still code. Even though it looks like in English in some sort of a way, it's still code. And code, as always, throws errors. So we've done all this hard work of building an English almost like DSL. We also need to keep in mind that the errors that we are throwing to the user of the DSL needs to be in the same language of the DSLs. For example, if I'm going to add a um, limitation on the text that it must be positive and not negative, I will throw a new exception, text value is negative, something meaningful to the user of the DSL. So almost final notes. Uh, I would like to go back and, and talk about if, uh, one thing. Getting the syntax done is hard. You remember I said that I used the capital four and the capital I. And also, I told you that my DSL wasn't that perfect because I still had the four parentheses country. Four parentheses country. Well, it's a balance be because you are trying to get and DSL that is meaningful to the user and is almost, almost English-like. But I spent, I think, like an hour trying to overcome the entry point of the DSL, the four parentheses something, and I said, well, screw it. I can understand it. It's meaningful enough. So I'm just going to leave it there. So another thing, another a point you have to remember is DSLs, the syntax of a DSL can be hard, and the, the scale of the expressivity this depends to you, up to you, which leads, it, which leads me to the second point. A DSL needs only to be expressive enough for the end user. In our imaginary system, we, we thought that the users of the DSL are going to be some non-technical guys, a product, a QA. So we made a huge effort to make the DSL looks like, look like it, so they will understand that. But if we are building a DSL that will help us uh, deploy cloud machines or operate, I don't know, some disk IOs. Cell doesn't need to be English. -like. All it has to do is define the abstractions and be clear to you, to the final user of the DSL. And the last, most meaningful point is DSLs are really, really fun. Once you like get the concept and write your first sentence, even that it's the most simple sentence at all. You have this urge to start and, and start to evolve it, start to see what else, what else you can do with the language you're building right now. So I encourage you all, just write a simple DSL with a simple function as I did. Don't use any of the Scala tricks and abstract types and whatever the language gives you. Start small and you will see how fun it is. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> any questions? Questions. questions? None. Oh, good. Thank you. Like, like in, uh, in the simple DSL for taxes, yeah. how much complicated do you think it would be like to add st stuff like state taxes per country and then uh, well, uh, date? Uh, taxes like by date and stuff like more advanced and complicated. Well, first of all, you said uh, you added a date. Well, you can add a date DSL as well. First of all, you can combine several DSLs into one because the date DSLs is just another object which has date operations and date methods. But combining it is basically, it's, um, it depends how well you define the abstractions. Like if you had, if you have a good abstraction and you can contain or either like combine several of the building blocks of your DSL, then you're good to go. In the worst case, you just add an implicit conversion from type to type and you can go on. In the, in the, in the, this is the good case. In the worst case, you have to take a step backward as I did and try to, to see what puzzles, what piece of the puzzle won't fit. Hi. Hi. Um, do you have any good references to material on? Yes. There's a great book that I spent almost a, a week reading. It's called DSLs in Actions. And I'm going to 
put a link of this now, which basically is a, it's a great book, covers all the concepts of DSL, both internal and external, and it has examples on DSLs on every language almost. There is Groovy, Scala, Java, and a few more even. So it's a great book. Anyone else? No, good. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Alon.